Hello friends. Today I'm going to be telling you the story of the super volcano Mount Tambora, which erupted 200 years ago and changed the world. For many of you, this might be one of the most astonishing tales that you've ever heard. It's also a tale that's very interesting because for a long, long time, like 160 years, people had no clue that this volcano was creating all the havoc and problems that it was creating. Let me first tell you about the eruption itself. It took place right next to Bali in Indonesia. On April 15, 1815, the first part of the eruption began, and there were three pillars of fire that went straight up into the air, thousands of feet. Nothing bad happened, but I think I would have run for the hills if I had seen that. And then three days later, all hell broke loose. I'm going to use comparisons to the Pacific Northwest where I live to give you some sort of a perspective on how big this was, because most people are not that familiar with Indonesia. This eruption was 100 times more powerful than the eruption of Mount St. Helens. The bomb that landed on Hiroshima back in World War II was 0.2 megatons of TNT in power. Tambora was 800 megatons of TNT in power. The sound that was produced from the eruption was so big that you could hear it the distance between Seattle and Minneapolis. In the first few days of the major part of the eruption, this black cloud spread out, an ash cloud. It covered an area the size of the distance between Portland and Vancouver. And within this framework, this area, it was five days of total darkness. Now, if that wouldn't scare the you-know-what out of you, I don't know what would. On top of that, of course, there was the ash. Well, I'm going to give you some perspective on the ash. I read somewhere a comparison to Fenway Park, so let's just do a general baseball park. If you did the ash coming up out or piling up out of a baseball park in America, the amount of ash that came out would have reached around the world twice. The ash in the area of the eruption that I was mentioning between Seattle and Vancouver was between three feet and nine inches deep. If the nine-inch rocks didn't get you, that were superheated and falling out of the volcano, well, that would starve you to death. And then in the major, on the main island where this erupted, there were pyroclastic flows, which are superheated gas mixed with magma that came down the mountain hundreds of miles an hour. There was an entire ethnic group with their own unique language that lived on the sides of this volcano. Well, they were completely toast. People hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles away thought that they were hearing cannon explosions, and a lot of people started going to war. The flow that was coming out of the volcano would have been equal to 180 times the outflow of Horseshoe Falls at uh, Niagara Falls at its peak. It did a number on that area. And 
a lot of the people, if they weren't killed by the initial eruption and the 12-foot tsunami, they were killed because of starvation, because all of the crops were killed and they, they couldn't manage all of that ash to replant. This was during the time of slavery, and some of the islands allowed slavery and some of them didn't. And the islands that allowed slavery, the people were able to live. The people that were living on islands without slavery, most of them died. 90,000 people died just from the initial eruption of Mount Tambora. The cloud from Tambora went five miles high, five times the height of a commercial jetliner. And in the first few days, all of this ash fell out. But then what was left was the really dirty stuff. It was the invisible stuff. It was the sulfur, the chlorine, the fluorine. And this because it happened in the tropics, and it was getting up so high, it got into the trade winds, and so it was blown all around the world. This was what caused all of the real havoc, as if the aforementioned wasn't already havoc enough. Before I, I leave the volcano, I want to give you one more tidbit. There were big floating barge-like collections of pumice on the ocean around there. And they were like the size of Elliott Bay. It was miles wide. And they stuck around for years. Well, getting back to this gas cloud, the sulfur that was up there, it went around, it created these spectacular sunsets. You can see right here, like Turner. Scientists can look back and look at these paintings taken during this era, and they can tell the actual composition of the, the, the gases that were up there. But the real damage didn't happen in the first year. It was sort of like, you know, a marriage that things start out bad, but they don't really come to a head until later, and this is what happened. The gas, the sulfur up there, started ionizing. And when it ionized, and, and mutated and changed with other molecules and merged and all that sort of stuff. It became a substance that reflected the sun back. And so all of a sudden, we were not getting the full heat of the sun in the areas where this gas was going over. Well, I'm going to go sort of sequentially around the world and tell you what was happening. In the U.S., it had the worst continent-wide drought ever. And of course that was really bad, but in the Northeast, it was horrible. In like New England, New York, that area, in May, when the growing season is going on, they had almost every night was frost. And then on the 6th of June, from Quebec down to Washington, D.C., snow fell, and it lasted for days, often as much as six inches of snow. Well, that put a nail in the coffin of the harvest, so they decided to re-sow the oats, or whatever they were growing. And Again, there was a bad frost at the end of July, I mean June, and then in July there was a hideous frost. The temperature would spike up to 90, but then it would, all of a sudden, the lakes and rivers would freeze. Yes, freeze. And this was in the middle of summer. It did it the same thing again in August. So, pretty much most all of the crops in all of the Northeast were just a complete failure. And this was before, you know, we had interstates and trucks bringing vegetables and stuff from California. You ate what was growing around you, and it was pretty bad. Another interesting 
phenomenon that happened during this period was that there was a persistent fog in the Northeast. It was a very dry fog, but very cold, icy. And in this fog, I can't imagine this, but they said that you could actually see the sunspots on the sun. This doesn't sound good at all. In the Arctic, lots of the Arctic melted. In fact, there was, they were planning to do a um, expedition that went from the Atlantic to the Pacific over Canada. And they thought they'd have a real good chance of doing it because so much ice melted, but they couldn't launch it. But what did happen was these gigantic icebergs broke off from the Arctic and came really far south, like New York City and Ireland. And of course, this cooled everything off. And Europe, Europe, well, it was interesting. Scandinavia and Russia, which normally gets the bad weather, had very nice weather. All of the bad weather moved south and was intensified. In England, in London, typically the average amount of sunny days in the summer is 22 days. I mean, it's not a lot, but those <laughs> precious few are appreciated. There were no sunny days at all. This was called the year without summer. And if that wasn't enough, they had horrible, horrible storms. Storms that came across the British Isles to the mainland that were so bad. You know, thunder and lightning normally lasts for maybe an hour. Well, this would be persistent thunder and lightning that lasted for days with gale force winds, trees being toppled over, and tons of water falling from the heavens. This, as I said, the same thing happened in Europe. It was particularly awful in Switzerland. They had rioting all over the place. Well, all over this area, 75% of the crops failed. Of course, the price of food went astronomical, and most of the people didn't have that much money. A lot of people were just starving to death. I'm not going to tell you some of the horrible, horrible things that I read that they resorted to. But they were pretty bad, and hordes of people died. If this wasn't bad enough, let's go to India, where the monsoon failed to arrive until very late. So the planting season didn't get started at the right time, and then when it came, it just came in torrents, so all the seed fell away. It was hideous weather, and they had terrible, terrible uh, famine because of this. The really scary thing that happened in India, and I don't exactly understand it all, but I'm going to tell it to you as I read it. In Bombay, cholera, which had been around for you know, centuries, it was not a particularly virulent disease, but it was always sort of around. But in the weird conditions of the weather that was happening in this famine and the floods and all of this stuff and the lower temperatures, it mutated. And it changed into a super bug of cholera that ended up killing over a million people. <laughs> Tambora is wrecking her havoc. China had bad floods, had you know, cold weather, snow in places that never snows, and they had failure of crops, so there was um, famine in China. And one last little tidbit here I'm going to leave with you is in Taiwan, which is on the same latitude as Florida. It's snow, snow. Tambora was a real monster. I never knew that there was a volcano this bad that was within historical times. And speaking of history, the thing that's interesting is that 
you know, all this horrible weather and death and destruction was happening all over the world. It was the worst famine of the eight, 19th century. But nobody connected it to this volcano. There were historical documents that took place at the site in Indonesia, but because there was no telegraph like when Krakatoa happened, people didn't find out about it. They found out about this connection when they started digging up ice cores. And this was in, the, I believe, the 70s. In Greenland and Antarctica, and they found the very salient record that there was all this sulfur and ash that was taking place. And the other thing that was interesting that they found was that there was another volcano that was probably the size of Mount Pinatubo, which was, you know, as you remember, the big volcano that happened in the Philippines. This volcano happened in 1809, so not that many years before this. And it sort of started this cooling trend. So that combined with Mount Tambora resulted in that decade being the coldest decade of the 19th century. It's a fascinating story. It's a horrifying story. The chances that scientists say of this happening again are only like 10% in the next 50 years. Let's hope that the 40% triumphs. They say if it happens though, it will happen in Indonesia. Because that's where the volcanoes are and also it's where the trade winds are, which would take these gases around the world to cause all of this havoc. I enjoyed telling you about the super volcano eruption of Mount Tamboro. Thank you.